Hey guys, um, I have been wanting to do like a series on how to get your life good when life has been hard or when life has been happening to you hard for a long time, um, aka discipleship, but I don't know if I want to call it that because that brings up a lot of religious ideas, which are just not going to be part of this at all. Um, but so I just want to you know, I know some people that are dear to me that I just want to be able to help them um, and give them life-giving knowledge. So, okay, so first of all, I just want to say that before you can live well, you have to believe right because you just have to. So in Habakkuk 2.4, it's, it says um, that... It says, um, behold the, okay, it says the just shall live by his faith. And that is also quoted in the New Testament. So the person who lives right actually lives out of faith because the law does not help you live right, contrary to popular belief. Um, it's a whole thing about the good news of Jesus versus the bad news of law, the law 2.0 or the bad news of the old covenant all over again, because a lot of the way the church teaches is, um, you know, it's as if Jesus didn't do anything that the blood of bulls and goats and sheep couldn't do, um, because they just are like, okay, well, he's going to give you a reset button, but you better behave this time. And obviously that doesn't work. That's putting them under law which um, is not why Jesus came. Jesus came to actually do something because the law was bringing death, and we're going to see that. But I want to show you this in Mark chapter 2, um, verses 18 to 22. I used to always wonder what this was talking about, but now I understand it because... Um, okay, so Mark chapter 2, what did I say? 18. And John's disciples and those of the Pharisees were fasting, and they came and said to him, Why do John's disciples and those of the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? And Jesus said to them, Can the sons of the bride chamber fast while the groom is with them? The bride, the groomsmen, how can they fast and be sad when the groom is with them? When they have the groom with them, they cannot fast, but the days will come when the groom will be taken away from them, and then they will fast in those days. And no one sews a patch of unmilled cloth on an old garment, or else it takes away its fullness, and the new from the old, and a worse tear occurs. And no one puts new wine into old skins, or else the new wine will burst the skins, and the wine pours out, and the skins will be destroyed. But new wine is put into fresh skins. So basically he's saying... Um, he's talking about the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. So, um, obviously the Pharisees were under the Old Covenant. And the, even John's disciples, they, I mean, Jesus hadn't died yet. So they were still under the law, still under the Old Covenant. Um, so, but Jesus was saying, this is a whole new thing. And it, it's going to be different. Because he was setting up a new covenant because God found fault with the old one because it brought death. And we're going to see that. But, so the point is, this is like law and grace. Law and grace, okay? Old covenant is law. New covenant is grace. You cannot put grace in law because it neutralizes both. And neither one can do its job. See, because um, that just like if you put old wine in, if you put... Old wine and new skins. What did I say? If you put new wine in old skins, <laughs> it will destroy both. And it's the same way. So a lot of churches, we don't understand. We are like stuck in this old way of thinking. And so we try to mix. We're like, okay, well, he forgave you by grace, but now you have to live under law to get your righteousness or whatever, your blessings. And that's that's what this is. He's this is exactly what he's talking about is putting the new wine into the old wine skins because when you mix law with grace, neither one can do its job because the the job of the law is to show people 
that they aren't good, they can't earn anything good, and they need a savior. Okay? That's the job of the law. And we're going to see this in future times, is to bring you to the end of yourself and um, so that you will let him save you and be happy to live under grace again. Um, and we'll talk about that more next time. But grace, the job of grace, is to actually make you a new person, a new creation, able to live a better life. The law cannot do that. Only grace can. But the law was necessary, and we'll see why next time I'm going to talk about, about that. Okay? So the law itself is good, but it can't make you good. The law is like a mirror to show you that your face is dirty. But you can't clean your face with the mirror. You have to have soap and water to clean your face. And it's exactly the same way the law will show you that you're dirty, but you can't clean yourself with the law. We're going to read this in... Because the law arouses sin, which brings death. We're going to read this in Romans 7. Okay. All of this stuff, I never knew what this meant until about five years ago. And it has been life-changing. Like, I memorized this stuff when I was a teenager, but I didn't know what it was talking about. Um, okay, Romans 7. Or brothers, are you ignorant? For I speak to those knowing law that the law rules over the man for as long a time as he may live. For the married woman was bound by law to the living husband, but if the husband dies, she is set free from the law of the husband. So then if the husband is living, she will be called an adulteress if she becomes another man's. But if the husband dies, she is free from the law so that she won't be an adulteress by becoming another man's. So that, my brothers, you also were made dead to the law through the body of Christ so that you could become another's the one raised from the dead, so that we can bear fruit to God. For when we were in the flesh, the passions of sin worked in our members through the law for the bearing of fruit unto death. But now we have been set free from the law, having died to that in which we were held, so that we serve in newness of spirit and not in oldness of letter. What then shall we say? Is the law sin? Let it not be. But I, but I did not know sin except through law. For also I did not know lust except the law said, You shall not covet. But sin, taking occasion through the commandment, worked every lust in me. For apart from the law, sin was dead. And I was alive apart from the law once. But the commandment came, and sin came alive, and I died. And the commandment, which was supposed to be for life, was found to be death to me. For sin, taking occasion through the commandment, deceived me, and through it killed me. So indeed the law is holy, and the commandment is holy and just and good. Then that which is good has it become death to me. Let it not be, but sin, that it might appear to be sin, having worked out death to me through the good, in order that sin might become excessively sinful through the commandment. For we know that the law is spiritual, and I am fleshly, having been sold under sin." For what I work out, I do not know. For what I do not desire, this I do. But what I hate, this I do. And But if I do what I don't desire, I agree with the law that it is good. But now I no longer work it out, but the sin living in me. For I know that in me, in my flesh, dwells no good. The flesh is the self-effort. The, the one that wants to live under law and try to earn good things and thinks that, you know, we that we're good and we can earn better things by, you know, earning it, then God wants to give us freely. And that's that pride. And that's the flesh is trying to say that, oh, we can do this. We don't need Jesus to come and be who he is to us and do what he did for us. Um, I find then, where am I at? I find then that the law, when I desire to do what is right, the evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God according to the inward man, but I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind and taking me captive by the law of sin being in my members. O wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then I myself with the mind truly serve the law of God and with the, law, with the flesh the law of sin. And that's how it was under law. Because... You know, people people wanted to do what was right, but they couldn't because law arouses sin. Just like we saw there, that he didn't he wouldn't have coveted except the law said, You shall not covet. <laughs> and so 
that's how law is. You can't live under law because you it destroys you. Um, classic example of this is when my uh, son was young. When my kids were little, they had no desire to smoke at all. They knew what smoking does to you, and we didn't smoke. But one day, unfortunately, my kids' dad said to my son, if I ever catch you smoking, I will ruin your life. And of course he had to smoke then. So he started smoking and now they both smoke. Well, I think my daughter might have quit. I'm not sure. After however many years. <laughs> Anyways, that's what the law does. That is what the law does. It arouses sin. And the strength of sin is the law. In 1 Corinthians 15, 56, that's what it says. 1 Corinthians 15. I don't know how long this is going to let me have, but I'm going to see. I'm trying to be quick here. It says, 1 Corinthians 15, 56. Um, now the sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. So, if it wasn't for the law, sin would not have that kind of power over us. And we're going to look at this on the next video more in depth, and I think this will make more sense. I'm just trying to be really quickly give you something here. So the law in the New Testament is called the ministry of death and the ministry of condemnation because that's what it brings. Um, 2 Corinthians 3, 4 through 18. 2 Corinthians. Okay. Um, says, and we have such confidence through Christ towards God, not that we are sufficient of ourselves to reason out anything as out of ourselves, but our sufficiency is from God, who also made us able ministers of a new covenant, not of letter of the law, but of spirit, of grace. For the letter kills, but the spirit makes alive. But if the ministry of death, having been engraved in letters in stone, was with glory, so as the sons of Israel could not gaze into the face of Moses because of the glory of his face, which was fading away, how much rather the ministry of the Spirit will be in glory. For if the ministry of condemnation was glory, much rather the ministry of righteousness abounds in glory. For even that which has been made glorious has not been made glorious in this respect because of the surpassing glory. For if the thing done away with was through glory, much rather the thing remaining in glory. And then it says, Therefore, having such hope, we use much boldness, not as Moses, who put a veil over his face, so the sons of Israel would not gaze at the end of the thing that was fading away. But their thoughts were present, their thoughts were hardened of them until the present. For until the present, the same veil remains on the reading of the old covenant, not being unveiled that it is, be it is being done away in Christ. It's fading away because the substance has come. But until today, when Moses is being read, a veil lies on their heart. But whenever it turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. And the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. But we all, with our face having been unveiled, having beheld the glory of the Lord in a mirror, are being changed into the same image from glory to glory as from the Lord's Spirit. So, um, the Ten Commandments, that's what was wrote on, written on stone, right? Was It's called the ministry of death and the ministry of condemnation because it aroused sin and sin brings death. Like, not just physical death, but like death in its many forms, like as the opposite of life. In the Hebrew, they have a word for life that's chayim, which is actually plural. So it's not just talking about physical life of this body, but like life in every area of your life. Like what happens when the favor of God comes on any area of your life? Life, life. Abundant life that Jesus came to bring. Um, so the law did not work to make us um, like God, but it says... Um, having beheld the glory of the Lord in a mirror, are being changed into the same image. So what works is looking at Jesus. Looking at Jesus is what changes your life, not a bunch of rules and regulations, not even the Ten Commandments. They cannot make you like Jesus. Only looking at Jesus, and it says in a mirror, like in the Word, you read the Word and you see Jesus, and that is what transforms you. Okay? Um, one more scripture real fast. I don't know how long I've got because, okay, Romans 8, 
and then next time we'll talk about this a little more in depth. Okay, so Romans 8. So it says, There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Jesus. Um, for the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus set me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, right, it aroused sin, God sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and concerning sin condemned sin in the flesh, so that the righteous demand of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, according to self-effort and law, but according to the Spirit. For the ones that are according to the flesh mind the things of the flesh, like do not touch, do not handle. But the ones according to the Spirit are minding the things of the Spirit, because the Holy Spirit will lead you into good things to do, and you won't even think about the bad things that you're not supposed to be doing. You'll be so busy doing the awesome things that God has for you to do. For the mind of the flesh is death, but the mind of the Spirit is life and peace. Because of this, the mind of the flesh of being under law and self-effort is enmity towards God, for it is not subject to the law of God, and neither indeed can it be. It's, it's trying to be, but it's, it can't. And those being in the flesh are not able to please God. When you're living, trying to live by rules, you're basically independent from God, and you can't, you can't please him. But you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, since the Spirit of God lives in you. If anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, this one is not his. But if Christ is in you, the body is indeed dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. Um, so when you were baptized into Jesus, you left your old nature behind, that sin nature that you got from Adam. It was left in the waters of, of baptism. It was buried. You were baptized into his death, it says in Romans 6, um, and then... And then uh, it was like you're buried with him, and then you rose again, a new person. So if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. All things have passed away. All things have become new. Okay, the spirit. if the spirit of the one having raised Jesus from the dead lives in you, the one having raised Christ from the dead will also make your mortal bodies alive through the indwelling of his spirit in you. Okay, for so then, brothers, we are debtors not to the flesh to live according to flesh. For if you live according to flesh, you're going to die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the practices of the body, you will live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. So that's the mark of the children of God is that we get to live in relationship with God. We get to live by the Spirit. Um, and that's where the life is, is we're doing life with him and um, he is in us and he's leading us and we get to just have adventures in God, right? And that's where life is. We're not even worried about trying to be whatever. We just look at Jesus and we become like him. So that is what I wanted to say this time and I will go into it more next time. All right. So thanks for watching.